we're going to continue with the different distinctions between these two views of the Noah law of the, of the seven mitzvot. One approach is that they are, well, one approach is that the seven Noah laws are distinct and unique and, uh, and are conceptualized differently than the laws <laughs> between God and Israel. In other words, there's the 613 and the 7, and they do not and they do not meet. They go their separate ways. Even though they may sound very similar, but it, but they're actually but you cannot compare and well, in other words, you can't draw conclusions from rulings, let's say, that you find relating to Jewish law to no eye law. Not necessarily. They run on different tracks. That's one approach. The other approach is no. Every time we see a certain type of mitzvah for B'nai Noach, um, then we have to look at the whole body of Jewish law related to that particular Noahide law. And if it's generally somehow loosely fits in, we inc it's included. Those are the two approaches. Uh, and we said last time that according to the first approach, you really don't have a lot of reference. You could say you have a lot of room for, for, for innovation, maybe, or certainly there's a lot of room for new rabbinic uh, interpretations to be made. But you really don't have any corpus, you know, body of law to look at as a resource, according to the first approach, because they run separately completely. On the other hand, according to the second approach, you look at the Jewish law, you look at the Talmud, you look at the code of Jewish law, you look at the Rambam, you look at the, all the authorities, you know, and, 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 and you can extrapolate and apply and, and draw analogies or just straight out, just apply it. Boom. Just take it, paste it, take it from one place, put it in the other place. End of story. And um, so that's the second approach. And I was saying that um, from what I see from the writers and authors that discuss no white law, it seems that they have adopted the second approach because they generally do quote from Jewish law. We studied the book, The uh, Path of the Righteous Gentile. And um, uh, you know, Rabbi Chlorphine, I was looking over at the book because I was trying to remember his name, but Rabbi Chlorophyne, um should be well. He um, he cites a lot of the rulings of the Rambam of Maimonides in his code, and um, those are really directed towards Israel. And he quotes them. So this to me tells me that we are looking to the Jew to Jewish law as a resource, and are generally applying it, even if it sometimes it brings up certain things that are more strict or not necessarily have to fit into um, no I laws, just strictly speaking. Um, but they do, and they actually are no I law because we apply the second approach, which is that everything is ador adopted and incorporated. If it's loosely related. Uh, the divine code, I think, does the same thing. So this seems to be the approach, and I think it's just, it makes sense. It's practical, and uh, and it's also... You know, because it's based on precedent. We have to base the decisions on previous decisions of the, of the great authorities of the past. We don't have that according to the first approach. You're left with very little to, to, to draw any conclusions from. Well, anyway, that's, that's, that's what it appears to me. Anyway, that's the first, the first element of this, of this difference of opinion. And... Um, and we said also that according to the first view, <clears throat> for example, theft, you break it down into the taking of another, you know, the taking of the possession or the property of another, right? So in other words, you conceptualize theft. It's not a guy grabbing something or a guy holding a gun. It's the basic, you break it down to this bare bones concept. And the taking of another's property. So that could be even trademark, you know, it could be 
all types of things, except when it comes to just causing harm or damage to someone else's property, it doesn't really, it doesn't necessarily fit in. Causing harm to someone's reputation doesn't really fit in. So none of those would fit in, would be incorporated and be requirements under Noahide law according to the first approach. However, if, men, if humanity has adopted certain further strictures, even the first approach agrees you can then, we can add more if it's in the spirit of the Noahide laws and a, and a society can add certain things. But it's not actually forbidden biblically, so to speak, as it is according to the second approach. Um, yeah, so we said that according to the second approach, we look at categories. We don't look at just a general concept of, 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 a, of a prohibition, but we look at an entire category. In other words, the Torah says that, that human beings shouldn't steal from another, children of Noah shouldn't steal from each other. It's a, it's a hint, it's an allusion to the whole corpus of law between one person and another. Uh, meaning to say, just like you shouldn't shouldn't commit theft, so too you shouldn't violate other people's boundaries in many other ways. It's just really an example. It's it's a you know um, as opposed to uh, it being it 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 doesn't confine the prohibition biblically into certain narrow boundaries. All right. Now we're continuing. That was a summary of page 150, half of 151. And I had to do that particularly because I just said that I don't review anything. So I had to contradict myself and review something. So we now reviewed it. But now it was important because we're getting back into it. So we first have to have a short review. All right. So now if you look at the, the second paragraph, on page 151, it says as follows. Second point of difference between the two views is that the first view also limits the law to the prohibited activity itself. Okay, so according to the first view, only the prohibited activity is forbidden. Okay, that doesn't sound like any surprise or anything unusual. The second view includes other prohibitions or prescriptions from within the totality of the revelation, which safeguard against transgression of the base, basic Noahide law. Okay, this is key, and this is something we have to give a little bit of an introduction about this. <laughs> so there's this idea you probably heard of, and that is the idea of a fence around the Torah. You may you probably heard about this. <clears throat> now, generally speaking, that's a duty given to the rabbis and sages to institute decrees to safeguard the essential prohibitions. People shouldn't come to doing the prohibitions. So anything similar or approaching it is also forbidden by the rabbis. So that's quite a few prohibitions on my end. That's quite a few additions. But either way, <laughs> there is though a case in which such a prohibition or fence is actually biblical. And that is in the case of sexual immorality and sexual prohibitions. When the Torah says that thou shalt not come close to uncovering nakedness of any of the forbidden unions. So and that's in Leviticus and, and maybe Ross will know where it is, but I'll have to look it up another time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, it's mentioned in the Maimonides and the Talmud and other places, but in Hebrew it's Lo tikruvu legalot erva. You should not come close to uncovering, you know, forbidden nakedness, etc. So, so we see from this that the Torah does make offense in the case of these type of prohibitions. So according to the first view of Noahide law, this, this particular offense, biblical offense around sexual prohibitions is not incorporated. Thank you. Ross says it's Leviticus 18.6. Thank you so much. That's where it says you shouldn't come close to uncovering nakedness of a forbidden, of a forbidden partner. Okay. 
So again, according to the first approach that we have specific laws that are forbidden, it's not a whole category and there really aren't a lot of additions. It's just a, a general statement, you know, like I said, for, for example, not to, um, not to make, not to do a taking of um, and disown uh, something that belongs to your friend, right? In terms of theft. So same here, if the idea of sexual prohibitions is you should not have intercourse with, with one of these forbidden people with forbidden partners. So then coming close to doing so is not gonna be forbidden. But according to the second approach that it's general categories and old Jewish law related to those categories will be included. This is one of those, those things. One of those things is offense of, as the first says, none of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord, very good. Okay. All right, so we get what I'm saying. So according to the second approach, even this fence that the Torah mentions of coming close approach. What is the idea of approaching, by the way? The idea of approaching is explained by in the Talmud and brought in Maimonides and elsewhere as chibuk v'nishuk. Chibuk v'nishuk. What does that mean? Chibuk is, is um, embrace. Nishuk is kissing. I mean, the idea is, in other words, um, you know, uh, uh, um, romantic affection towards a forbidden a person who is of a forbidden relative, according to, to, to children of Israel, is forbidden. And according to the second view, it's also going to be forbidden to the children of Noah. Okay. Let's continue on page 152. Thus, under the law of forbidden sexual relationships, the first view prohibits only a specific set of relationships. According to the second view, there are also there also applies to humanity a larger prohibition, which is drawn from the 613 commandments of drawing close to prohibited relationships, i.e. in forms of intimacy short of direct sexual relations. For those persons with whom sexual relations are prohibited, so with those people, it's forbidden to even draw close. In parentheses, it says, except where it is certain that a prohibited sexual relationship will not result from the closeness that might be permitted. Okay. Let's continue. Well, although he says an interesting thing there, he's saying that in other words, some type of affection that is not romantic would be permitted. So in other words, I mean, what this basically means is, um, to give a to give a uh, an aunt or I don't know um, a grandparent or something like this. I'm trying to think of the right case. A grandparent might be permitted anyway. Let me think. So an aunt, um, someone else's wife, for example. Are you allowed if you're socially meeting someone? Can you give another man's wife a kiss on the cheek? Is that forbidden or permitted? You know. And so what we're saying he's saying here in the parentheses is that. If it's just as a form of saying hello, it's permitted. All right, so in many part and parts of the Orthodox Jewish, particularly in the Haredi community, the custom is not to do it at all, but nevertheless, according to the, the bare law, it's permitted if it's only, if it's not done in, in a um, form of, of a romantic affection, I guess, it's or even affection in general. Okay. The always, of course, the problem with that is how, how do you draw the line and how do you know what's what? In other words, if someone allow, if we allow people to hug and kiss strange strangers that are for, that are of forbidden union, how do we know what their real intention is? How do we know that they're not otherwise maybe drawing some type of sensual enjoyment from the act? Anyway, I, I'm just, I digress. That's just, that's, but this is what the law is. Okay. This would, according to the second view, be included in the no prohibition of binaural sexual relationships. So it's kissing, hugging, and meaning coming close to 
to into start forbidden into relationships, forbidden intercourse would be forbidden according to the second approach, as I've said already. Another example is in the Noah prohibition of theft. Whilst the act of theft is alone prohibited by the first view, second view includes within the prohibition of theft prohibiting prohibitions on coveting or desiring another's property from among the 613 commandments. Second view includes them within the Noahid law of theft since they potentially lead to the basic actual prohibited act of theft. In the first view, such remote counsel or precautions are not required in Noahid law. So if you look at the footnotes, he says that this language of remote counsel is expressly said, brought in the Rambam and the laws of Tamura of exchange of different holy objects. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Next, 152, bottom of the page. A third difference affecting whether or not some of the 613 commandments will apply also in Noah law is in regard to the interpretation of scriptural verses referring to one's fellow. To which community does these refer? Only to Jews among themselves or also to non-Jews among this, themselves? If this is a commandment which is within the categories of Noah law, then according to the second view, it will also be taken to apply to humanity at large. According to the first view, the words one's fellow or one's countrymen, the five books of Moses limit the application of the commandment using this expression to Jews only. So look at the, so this is a very fascinating question um, from a logic standpoint, whether when the Torah says one fellow, is it, is it a command to, no, to non-Jews as well or not? And look at the way he sets it up sets it up, it has to that, um, even if it's accepted that the word one fellow applies to non-Jews, but it would be two separate communities. That's just what he, he's implying. That the verse was speaking to the Noahide community would be speaking from one ben to the next. And to the Jewish community, one, one to the next. Okay. Let's see, the, let's see the footnotes. This is a very interesting topic. Obviously, this is extremely expansive concept. In other words, this principle would be applied, well, all over the place, right? I mean, this expression is used extremely often. And so to curtail its application to the Noahide community would cut off an, a really an entire trove of, 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 of laws and say that it doesn't apply to the Noah. Let's see footnote 38. Again, in commandments not specifically addressed to the Jewish people. So anyway, this would only apply to commands not specifically addressed. It doesn't say speak to the Jewish people, which is said generally. Compare here the words of the, the Shulchan Aruch Harav, All right, so he's talking about that the code of law of Rav uh, Schneir Zalman for the first uh, Rebbe Lubavitch, he wrote his, his own Shulchan Aruch, his own code of law. And there he says in the laws of theft, um, law 23 quotes that the prohibition of outright theft and robbery is no different between the case of Jews and general humanity since the expression Re'acha, your brother, is stated only in regards to Oshik alone. As it said, Lo Sashuk as Re'acha below Sigzon. So this is interesting. I mean, this is interesting in, in, in many different points. So he's saying here that the when the verse says you shouldn't cheat your friend and you shouldn't steal. So in regards to stealing, it doesn't say your friend. So therefore, the author of the uh, of the Code of Jewish Law, uh, the Rav Code, it's, this is in other words, Rabbi Shneir Zalman, his his code. He implies this, he alludes to this, that since it says, and thou shalt not steal without saying your friend, that definitely applies to non-Jews. However, the first part seems to apply uh, to Jews. What that means though, what do we mean by that? It seems to mean that the first law meaning is a prohibition that was given to Jews. It may also apply from a Jews to non-Jews, but the second one applies to everybody. That's what he's saying.
he's saying that the prohibition against some forms of cheating, since the verse talks about between Jews, that's forbidden for Jews to do, but not expressly forbidden for non-Jews to do. However, when it, since it says thou shalt not steal, so that's clearly outright to non-Jews as well. Now, obviously, this only fits according to the first approach, that the prohibitions are very narrow. According to the second approach, it's understood that the words one's fellow applies to the non-Jewish community also. Although, again, it could be that it's usually it's generally meaning within each community within themselves. But let's let's continue. Let me see. Let's continue in the footnote. This is a very, very big discussion. It's a whole topic. You probably write uh, you know, a thesis on this. In other words, the presence of the word reacha, your friend or neighbor, implies that this commandment does not apply to humanity at large. Such an expression however, would not exclude humanity at large in dealings with one another in the second view. So in other words, I mean, if you do read the Torah, this may be a little bit like hard to understand. But if we read the Torah in its text, the way it states, it does seem to be saying that certain things are forbidden from one person to his fellow, but not necessarily to a stranger. Um, and, but, and then, but, the, but the most egregious things are forbidden even to a stranger. Look, by the way, just because the Torah doesn't expressly forbid something doesn't mean God wants it done, right? In other words, for example, just like we said about sexual prohibitions, right? They're even just being promiscuous is also does something that will not make you righteous if you engage in it, but the Torah doesn't expressly forbid it. So the point is, just because the Torah doesn't expressly forbid something doesn't mean that it's proper necessarily. But the point is here is that if you look at the verses and what the Torah was seeking to forbid biblically, you could come to the conclusion, and definitely and many authorities seem to, that certain bad actions, the Torah is only expressly forbidden between a man and his community within his own community. However, with, among strangers, or I guess you could even say to enemies even, with them, the Torah only forbids, forbids the most egregious acts. That seems to be what we're saying, right? Cheating doesn't say it's forbidden, but it says, if, but, but the theft is forbidden. So, and the same thing between Noahide. Interestingly enough, according to this approach, Ben Noah, it's not forbidden to do those things biblically to a Jew, but it's forbidden with his own community. Same idea. That's according to this approach. Um, yeah, I mean, how hard it might be for us to, to accept this, but if you look at the words, this is what it seems to say. When he says, you love your, your neighbor or as yourself or your friend as yourself, it's, it seems to be talking about somebody, not anybody, but someone in close to you within your community. Or, But the thing is, I have a problem with this, is that there's another verse that talks about specifically about the ger that says, and we read it a few weeks ago, that, that if the ger falls into very bad financial straits, you have to help him. So if that's the case, it makes no sense to say that the Torah seems in that verse seems to be including the ger, ger toshav, in other words. It says toshav, doesn't it just say ger, it says toshav as well. It says uh, sojourner. But, uh, so if that's the case, I mean, if you have to help him financially and help him get out of a tight financial situation, but you can cheat him, that doesn't make any sense. So you have to, so... Um, I would even argue to say that this might not a not might not a I may well I mean who am I to differ but I just bring up the point that it sound that it's possible that they may be overlooking the fact that this isn't talking about a Ben Noah. This is talking about a non-Jew who's not a Ben Noah. In other words, maybe a Ben Noah who is attached to the Jewish community is part of the community and is called Reacha, your neighbor. And but only a non-Jew that doesn't apply to who's not a Ben Noah. 
He doesn't say that here. I'm just humbly arguing that there may be a basis to, to disagree a little bit with what he's saying here. Shall I repeat that again? All right, what I said was that since we see that the Torah commands the, the Jewish people to assist a, no, a Ben Noah financially, in other words, meaning to say, someone who settles in the land and, key, and, and, is, and is careful to, be, to keep away from idolatry and otherwise keeps the seven laws, Torah says you have to help him out of a bad situation. For example, if he has, sells himself as a slave, you have to redeem him just like a, a Jew. And as he gets into a advanced financial situation, you got to help him. Well, if that's the case, it doesn't make any sense to say, yeah, you have to help him if he gets into a bad situation, but you're allowed to cheat him. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't flow. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it's contradictory. So I would have, I think, and, and I also have seen that in, in, in contemporary works that they bring the same thing, that a Ben Noach, a Jew is obligated to give charity to a Ben Noach and, do acts of loving kindness to Ben to assist him based on these verses here. So this doesn't seem to jive with what he's saying there, that they're two different communities. I think that the Ger Toshav, who's attached to the Jewish community, seems would like would have a different rule. There's another thing I want to add that, that, that why I'm saying this, and that is that because the, the Talmud says in several different places that when it says that Reacha, when he says your friend, Meaning a friend means your friend in the commandments, meaning that he's a co-religionist, that he has at least, you know, he's, he has a basic moral standing, or at least, you know, he's, his life is guided at least, and maybe he's made some mistakes, but he's, he's a co-religionist. He's your brother, he's not wicked, he's your brother in Torah and, and the commandments. So if that's the case, it seems to me that Ben Noach, since he's far from idolatry, you know, and keeping the seven laws, it would be arguable to say that he's also your friend in the commandments, and it would apply to him. So, I I, I don't know. I might I kind of uh, I don't really have the authority to disagree with the author, but at the same time, I guess I am. Not as a final ruling because I don't have that authority, but I'm just asking as a question that it appears to me that maybe this whole this whole difference of opinion of the authorities is not really talking about our case at all. It's talking about a Gentile who's not a Ben Noach. Because obviously that's a totally different community. That's If they are idolaters and they don't, don't have the same moral code, then that's, um, you know, a separate, uh, would be deemed a separate community. Now, for people who are Christians and so on nowadays, it's a big discussion whether or not they're considered, you know, idolaters or not. There's a difference between the early authorities. Maimonides said they're idolaters. And the Meiri, some others, again, say that it's it's considered shutfus, which is how you, a partnership of belief and not full-blown idolatry. And that, um, uh, so again, that would that would be an interesting question if they would be considered your brother. But, but I don't think that a, the difference is that a Christian couldn't be considered your brother in the commandments because he doesn't accept the yoke of heaven and the laws from Moses. You know, in other words, the the underlying base is not there. Um, so it seems to me that would not be included. But again, Ben Noach, who keeps the seven laws, I think would be considered Rayacha, your your neighbor, your friend in the commandments, so to speak. Okay, any questions on what I'm saying? Because I'm going off topic, but because this difficult topic. Um, and also, we should probably finish this footnote. And I should review again. According to the footnote, he's saying that all the laws in the Torah that it says, don't do this to your friend, don't do that to your friend, it's talking on a communal basis. And that would mean a very interesting situation, which from one Ben Noah, from one Gentile to another, they have to be careful among their own because it's their community. And so the Torah requires among an own, its own, own community, your own family and your own neighbors, that you should be more careful and, have, and make sure to have a, a brotherly relationship with each other and more things are forbidden. However, if it's in foreign country, you know, then and foreign neighbors, which are in a often adversarial relationship, you're not, you don't have that requirement. The requirement is only the most egregious things like murder and theft, but other things are not forbidden. So that's what we were uh, learning here in the footnote. Again, this is according to the approach 
This is even according to the approach that says that we do adopt those laws, but it would be each community to itself. Now, Let's go to the next, let's continue because there's some more interesting things in the footnote. Okay. The, thus the Ramban in his commentary on Genesis includes a prohibition against price hiking. Oh, now amongst Noahide obligations, even though the Torah prescribes this in the verse, lo sono isha sachiv, person should not oppress his brother. So my, so Nachmanides, says that a, that a non-Jew is forbidden to oppress his brother, uh, which has which is either means verbally oppress, it could also mean monetarily oppress, also meaning oppressing him in terms of overpricing items, selling things for too high and, and taking too much advantage and, and hurting others by overcharging. So basically what he's saying is here is that Nachmanides says this applies to the Benoah. Next paragraph. The Shaos of Chuvas Avne Nezer, now in the response of the famous Rabbi Avne Nezer, that was the name of his book. He gives an important insight into the approach of the Sefer Chinuch, the Ramban, and with regards to all those mitzvahs in which the expressions your fellow and your brother and your fellow national alike are used. For the first view, the Rambam and the Shulchan Acharav, all commandments using these expressions would be limited to conduct between Jews. Yet for the second view, this is not so. The Abelinezer, which rules in accordance with the position of the Ramban, with regard to the content of the Noah Mitzvah of Dinim, states that the expression of, of your friend and the like or your neighbor refers to the community of non-Jews amongst themselves and to the community of Jews amongst themselves. He says clearly that this is not the position of the Rambam. Okay. So it's very interesting that we're saying here that, again, that each community to its community. Okay. Again, I think that a non-Jew keeping the seven laws in the land of Israel um, may not be considered a separate community. So look at this on page 154. He just elaborates on what I was saying. Um, again, he's not, this isn't things that our author is making up. He's, this is based on the authorities we just talked about. Nachmanides, the Rambam, and their different approaches. So he says, according to the second view, it relates to fellow members of any community, whether Jews amongst Jews or humanity at large within itself. For the second view, the commandment you shall love your fellow as yourself, thus applies to all communities within themselves, amongst their fellows. This does not exclude regard for others of any community, but relates to the extra regard required for one's immunity community, whether Jewish or not Jewish. So he's saying this isn't the minimum, this is the maximum. In other words, that the rule of loving your fellow by yourself is a high bar. And therefore, that's that's going to apply to your own personal community, like your family, and and to others. Is there's a lower bar? I guess what I find interesting in this is that can we really say that the whole world is a global community? Wouldn't that end up having to really say that that each nationality this should apply to, or each country, or something? I mean, is it really morally sensible to say that? The Jewish people is one community and the whole wide world is its own other community. I mean, that's a very progressive, I don't know if I should use that word, but you know, that's a very uh, modern idea. The whole is a world community out there. I mean, people didn't really look at themselves as a world community. And they expect, and, and, we, and does it really make logical sense to say that a person's fellow, if there is a not, they're a non-Jew, is someone on the whole other side of the world that they don't know, you know, they have no connection to culturally. Although I'm just asking a question. I don't have an answer. He seems to be saying that, yes, because maybe because according to law, again, that they, they have in common the same, keeping the same laws, and therefore 
you know, they basically, they have more in common. They're, they're in the same, they're, they're on the same mission. So it doesn't matter how many they are, where they are, they're still all together. Seems to be the approach. Okay. So that's the end of that topic. I think he's moving on to something slightly different now. Apart from the okay. seven Noahide laws, which are generally negative commandments, there are a number of laws learned about the legal obligations of general humanity from verses of scripture as elucidated in the tradition of the oral law. So in other words, aside the seven, there are some other things in the Torah that seems to particularly relate to Noahides and are obligatory on them. We'll see what he means by this. Oh, you know what? I have to stop and we have to look at uh, footnote 42 because it's very fascinating. We're going to go back just for a moment. I, I apologize. Sometimes I'm a little out of order. I apologize. We're going back, back to the topic of the verse, love your fellow as yourself. And there's an interesting comment from Rabbi Jonas and Steif. I actually have the book, Sefer Mitzvah Hashem, in which he has a whole... He has, he has a whole section that is, that is focused on Noah, on law, on, on the Menenoach law. And he writes that the obligation of love of one's fellow is indicated before Sinai uh, uh, as incumbent on all humanity. Based on the Midrash, gracious Rabbah, the Midrash says, this is the book of generations of men. Elu told us Adam. And as I say, it's that this verse indicates the great principle in Torah, that this is the this is the story, the book of the generations of man. This represents the great principle of loving your fellow, of loving one's fellow as oneself. But by see to Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Steif cites the explanation of the Rivan that Ben Azai is of the view that this principle is learned from the above phrase, namely that each person should look at every other as though he had been generated from him as his offspring. Since this, introduction, and since this instruction is reiterated after Sinai and the commandment you shall love your fellows yourself, he states that it is binding on humanity at large. Okay, so it's binding on all. But the thing is that according to what he just said, it seems to imply that it would imply equally to Jews and non-Jews also because we all come from the same Adam. So if the, if the basis of it comes from the fact that we're all the same family and all the same flesh, then it would apply equally to all of us, for all of us. And obviously that sits very well with the way mo most people feel the spirit of the law should be. Um, but the other approach is a little bit more practical and pragmatic. I mean, if you, know, if you look at the Tanakh and you look at Jewish history, you know, that the, the the nations around Israel were constantly at war with them at different times. Midian, and Moab, Ammon, you know, Egypt, not so much, but Egypt caused its own problems since, since the, the enslavement. Um, but the, my point is that, uh, you know, with, with foreign nations, um, there wasn't a very loving relationship. And certainly the Torah has to allow for warring situations of war and so on and uh, how how should how should a, an enemy you know nation be treated the same as love your fellow or is that just is that unrealistic so i think that's again that's the basis for the distinction i think the, the, you know why generally speaking so many authorities they understand you know love your fellows doesn't apply at least one of the reasons, it's not the only reason. I said before, the main reason has to do with accepting of Torah law or not, idolatry or not, God forbid. But I think there's another aspect having to do with what I just said. Anyway, all right, so here we have it. So basically, but the technical thing about to pay attention to what we just read is that Any mitzvah that was given to all mankind, and it was re reiterated at Sinai, re reverts back to, and it was re was re re uh, imposed upon all the nations, and that's what he's saying here. This was originally alluded to in the verse. This is the book of the generations of Adam, and so since the Torah later said you should love your fellows yourself, so it's reinstating that 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 demand on people. Okay. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Let's just finish up to the next 
category and we're going to stop. Let me start again from the beginning of this paragraph. Apart from the seven Noahide laws, which are generally negative commandments, there are a number of laws learned about the legal obligations, general humanity from verses of scripture as elucidated in the tradition of the oral law. So there's some other verses that are also pertinent to, to the Noahide community, even though they're not the seven. One commentator, for example, learns that there is a positive scriptural obligation upon humanity to give charity, which is not reckoned amongst the seven Noahide laws, which are all negative commandments. Other views on the Noahide obligation and charity are discussed below. There is also another view that, 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 that Noahides are obligated to have, be fruitful and multiply. There's a difference of opinion if that relates to them or not, um, but that would be another one. Okay, peeps. People, ladies and gentlemen, any questions on any of this? Any comments? There's a lot to swallow. There's a lot, a lot there. Particularly if you're not familiar with the nuances of halacha so much, um, it may seem new to you and these little, you know, the way we pay so close attention to words may be foreign to some people who aren't used to it, but <clears throat> what were you saying about fruitful and multiply? I was saying that it, I was saying that um, that's actually a very interesting one because the difference between that one and the well, it's interesting because it's not reiterated at Sinai, yet it's it's applicable to the Jews, but at the same time, there's difference of opinion whether it applies to non-Jews or not. However, most of them, most are of the opinion that even if that doesn't apply, but the, the obligation to settle the world and civilize it definitely applies. So there's just a difference of opinion is an obligation on every individual or only as a community. So in other words, if the verse be fruitful and multiply applies the same as to Jews, then every individual male is obligated to have two children, male and female child. Just like a Jew or an Israelite. However, if the obligation comes from the prophet's statement that God created the world to be settled, it doesn't necessarily fall on every person. It's a general societal obligation. And then one individual may, you know, opt out. I mean, it's not favorable to opt out of what God wants, obviously, but uh, it's still not an absolute obligation. Yeah, because when you said that, it triggered my memory yes it was said to adam and then it was said almost exactly verbatim to noah to noah the, exactly yeah it said to noah there's some and, opinions that say that was a blessing it wasn't an obligation to noah you know there's different but it's the same wording i think it said exactly the same word so it's kind of hard to say that it's not an obligation it's almost exactly what was said to Adam. Right. I mean, I don't, it's hard. But then again, uh, when Abraham is begging for Ishmael's life, um, or at least, you know, he's going to be sending him away. God tells Abraham straight up. He says, you know, as for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and multiply exceedingly. Right, but that's a blessing, not an obligation, right? A blessing, definitely. I, well, in each case, you know, God blessed Adam, and then God blessed Noah, and here God blesses Ishmael, and then it goes on, and Jacob eventually gets his blessing. Uh be fruitful and multiply a nation a multitude of nations shall come from you. Well, that's actually for Abraham and Kings will come from you. So I guess at last blessing, having gone to Abraham, any of his descendants uh, are a result of that blessing. Again, but let's not get confused between what we're talking about and blessings. We're talking about whether the obligation to have children was biblically commanded, obligated upon the nations after the you know, children, after Sinai. That's the question. Whether they're obligated individually 
or whether the world was just sufficiently populated and God gave that to the Jews only and it's not a full-blown individual obligation, but something on the society. Look, I'm just telling you what the differences of opinion are. And right, I'm, I'm listening. Okay. One is, like I said, one approach is that it, that this applies to the nations as well. One approach is that it applies to them as a community, but not on the individual themselves. Is it? So that's, in other words, some say be fruitful, multiply, is a directive to every, same as to a Jew. Every male has to have at least one male and female child. The other approach is, no, as a community, you have to make the world civilized and settled. So somebody's got to do it, but not necessarily everybody. Um, so that's, that is as far as that goes, yeah. as far as that. But he brings up the issue of charity, that charity is something that is a positive commandment on all humanity. Another thing he doesn't mention is the obligation to honor your parents, but that's really, again, included in rational, a rational obligation. We discussed that weeks ago. Okay, so we came across some incredible things here. Incredible applications uh, and distinctions here. Uh, and um, we shall continue next time.